Hey guys, this scary encounter always stuck with me. So, a few years ago, my boyfriend's dad's family decided to get together and all chip in to rent a condo in Ontario and get together. There was a big, extended family over there that his dad never saw, because he only really got along with one of his three sisters. My boyfriend's mom had talked him into going, though, and they let me tag along because I'd been around long enough that they liked me and trusted me. I can't remember where everyone else had gone, I think it was to the beach for what was probably like the third time that day. It was just me and my boyfriend at the condo, cause we were kind of sick of the beach and just wanted to do nothing in the shade for a while. We were sitting outside, looking over the water, and just kind of talking about life. I had just finished reading the Harry Potter series so we were just kind of talking about that for a bit when this woman came out of the brush beside the condo. Just for an idea, this condo was about an acre of land maybe? And it was kind of out in the middle of nowhere. The front of the condo was probably 70 feet from a dirt road no one traveled down really, and there were some dense trees and brush and whatnot that surrounded three sides of it. This woman came out of the wooded area and I immediately knew something wasn't right. She was limping and she only had one sandal, and frankly she looked like shit. She was pale and her face was gaunt. She was really, really pretty, but she just looked exhausted. The thing that immediately caught my attention was her baby, who she was holding pretty tightly in her arms as she started to come towards us. I didn't really know what to do, but my boyfriend immediately got up and walked over to make sure she was okay. I couldn't help but think all of these awful things might happen, after spending so many hours hearing these horror stories on Reddit, I was just terrified she'd do something. My boy is a lot more trusting than I am, though, and he's always had the first instinct of, what's the problem and how can I help? He's never assumed the bad in anybody. So this woman is just sobbing by the time she gets to the porch of the condo, and she looks like she's just been through a war zone. She's shaking, and hyperventilating, and crying, and she's telling us that basically her boyfriend has been a drunk for a while and he's been getting worse and worse, and he's been an overall abusive guy. He'd get pissed whenever she was focusing on the baby instead of him, and part of what pissed him off was that it wasn't his kid, so he kind of didn't care about the baby at all. She told us how this time in particular he was drunk and she was driving him home, with the baby in the back seat, and he grabbed the baby's booster seat and tore it out of the car and threw it out the window while they were driving. She got the baby out of the seat or something, I don't remember how because as she's telling us about how he started hitting her before she took the baby and ran, we hear this yelling, and we turn and see this angry dude walking up to the condo, and she starts losing it. Drunk and angry this guy followed her to our condo and was starting to come up to us. He was trying to act like he wasn't pissed. He was doing a, oh, you guys found her thank you so much. Baby let's go home, kinda thing but he was slurring his speech and not doing a good job of hiding how pissed he was. My boy has always been a pacifist. Honestly, he's even kind of a pushover. He's really non-confrontational and tries to find a way to talk stuff out and come to an agreement before doing anything, but before I could even say anything, he's across the yard and approaching this guy. As much of a pacifist as he is, he's also huge. He's built like a football player. He's six foot three, and at the time he was 230 pounds. I've known my boy since we were 10. At the time, we were 20, and we'd been dating for just over a year. I knew him better than anyone. He's never done anything like this before, but he goes up to this guy and goes, not another step, dude. And he's shaking as he says it. The guy tries to walk around my boy and goes, no it's okay I'm just gonna take her home, and my boy steps in front of him and shakes his head. You're drunk, he said. So I'm gonna pretend like maybe you didn't get what I just said. Don't come any closer. It's at this point the guy stops trying to pretend, and he says something like, you don't know what's going on. That's my girlfriend, I'm gonna take her home, and he tries rounding my boyfriend again, and one more time my boyfriend blocks him and goes, stop. I've never heard this tone in his voice before or since. It was scary. It wasn't him. 
The guy tried one more time before my boy finally put his hand on his chest and pushed him back a bit, keeping his hand on the guy's chest. I'm telling you right now, you're not going anywhere near that girl and her child. So turn the fuck around, and walk away. This guy was about 5 foot 6, maybe 5 foot 7, so when he looked up to threaten my boyfriend, he looked like a kid. The guy finally looks up at my boyfriend, and he says something that I couldn't hear. My boyfriend said something back and then the guy stared at him for a moment, like he was deciding whether or not to do anything. My boyfriend finally pushed him away, and the guy stumbled back, and then started pointing at me and the girl as he was saying something, and then he started to walk away. I didn't learn till the next day but the guy had told my boy that he had a gun, and that he was coming back, and that he'd kill him and I if we stopped him again. My boyfriend's response to this changes depending on who's telling the story. Origin he told me he told the guy he'd feed him his own teeth, which made me laugh cause he's such a dork and he got that from a movie, and ever since then the line he tells everyone else is, I'll be waiting. The woman was sobbing. The baby was sobbing, and I was shaking because even though he didn't throw any punches or anything, I could tell that he was ready to hurt this guy if anything else had happened. We called the police, and didn't really do much of anything outside to make sure everyone was breathing and took the girl to her sister's place. We didn't really hear much from her after, but I know my boyfriend sent her an email once or twice and she's married now to someone else and had another kid last time they talked. It was a really nice trip, despite that part, and a fight my boy's dad got into with someone in his family. A few years ago when I was working for a wildlife blog I was lucky enough to get to travel to Japan to photograph multiple notable locations. This story is about a bamboo forest in Arashima, Kyoto, as I never made it to any of the other cities as planned. The forest was called Sagano. It was apparently teeming with insects and wild monkeys. Sounds like a great location to shoot for a nature website, right? So here I am, fresh out of college, I had only been at my current job for a few months, and they sent me across the world for some field work. Prior to the trip I was mainly editing photos and writing articles about local hikes. The blog was growing fairly popular, especially with travelers, so we decided it was time to expand and focus more on travel alongside wildlife. I guess I was the easiest person to send since I still lived at home, no spouse, no kids, no pets, I mean it seemed pretty logical to me. I also want to mention just how stoked I was to get to go to Japan. I grew up watching anime and had moved through that uncomfortable phase in middle school where I was completely obsessed with the culture. I remember drawing little people that had big anime eyes and cat ears during class and trying to cover them with my hands when people would walk by. At the time of the trip, I was no longer as obsessed, but it had always been a dream of mine to get to go to Japan and experience their culture firsthand. The flight was ironically one of the best flights I've ever had. In the past I was always on the cheapest airline with my knees basically crammed up against the seat in front of me sandwiched between someone who just needed to be near a window and somebody with some medical excuse that required them to be on the aisle. I'm not very outspoken so I wasn't even going to argue, but they always seemed to be ready to fight to the death over the seats. Anyway, the flight there was pretty great, spacious, I sat by the window with a person on the aisle and nobody between us, and there were no small children screaming. This seemed to set the mood for an amazing trip, but I was not prepared for what would happen to me in two days. I'm gonna try my best to get to the point of the story, so I'm gonna skimp a bit on the details of the first day there. The hotel was small and a bit run down, but it was still pretty cheerful and in a nice area. I took a nap as soon as I unpacked in the early evening. I wasn't tired enough to sleep all the way through my first night since I had slept on the plane most of the way, so I took a walk around the neighborhood in Kyoto and then went to watch YouTube videos until I could go sightseeing. My boss agreed that my first day in each city didn't have to be work, I could go sightseeing all I wanted, and then for the next few days I would go photograph the locations I was sent for. I was starting in Kyoto, then heading to Osaka, then Nagoya, and then flying out of Tokyo. I went out and ate at a tourist Y restaurant, went to a few bars, enjoyed a museum, and then checked out a local market. 
It was like being in a dream, honestly. I was having such a great time and I could not wait until I would get to go to the Sagano Bamboo Forest the next day. I had googled pictures countless times in the weeks leading up to my trip, and every single time I was imagining getting great shots for the blog, like monkeys posing for me or macro lens close-ups of intricately patterned moths. Fast forward to the next day, I've got my hiking outfit on, my expensive camera, a bag of equipment, my bug repellent sprayed on, a map, snacks, a mini umbrella in case it decided to rain, there was no forecast for rain, and a new translator app since my old one didn't go well with the people at the museum the day before. I looked like a nerdy tourist, but I didn't care, I had already been called gaijin, roughly meaning outside person, a few times since I got there. It was extremely hard to find the entrance to the forest. There was one small sign that pointed me in the right direction, and it was incredibly easy to miss especially when trying to read a language you can hardly speak or understand. I was already running late by the time I made it there, it was early afternoon. I would have to stay here until the sun was almost down to make up for my lost time. It seems easy enough. Sagano was not a huge park, 16 square km, and it was pretty close to civilization, even having some temples and residencies within it, I had also learned about a week before my trip that the monkeys were in a separate park nearby so it would be highly unlikely I'd see one, but I didn't mind since there would still be a lot of material there. It was supposed to be about a four-hour hike uphill and then ending with a traditional Japanese villa previously owned by a famous actor. The forest itself was very crowded and touristy, I saw many other Americans and even a family that was visiting from Dubai, I remember the whole family spoke Arabic, English, and perfect Japanese, I was incredibly jealous and had asked them to help me with a few Japanese phrases I still needed to get down. It consisted of a path with a bamboo railing on each side of the path that took you through. I already knew this when I saw pictures of it online, but I was expecting more places to go off trail on my own. I didn't really see any that looked promising other than locals dressed as geishas for people to pose and take pictures with, I definitely did. The deeper you went into the forest, the less you could hear the sounds of the city until eventually all you could hear was the buzzing of insects, chirping of birds, and leaves swaying in the wind, and the huge crowds of people. This place was beautiful. Absolutely breathtaking. Like nothing I had ever seen growing up in New Mexico. The sound of the wind in the bamboo was easily one of the most amazing things I had ever heard. Almost great enough to make me come back to that place. I had taken a lot of pictures by the halfway mark mid-afternoon, but I wasn't satisfied with most of them, it was very hard to keep people out of them. Most of the wildlife would stray far from the path and noisy tour group, and I knew I had to go explore off-trail in order to find anything worthwhile. So as I was walking and saw a break in the barricade, I took that as a sign that I should go off there, and I started to stray behind until I eventually found an opportunity to slip away. I tried my best to move fast and quietly to get away with nobody noticing as soon as possible so I could go deeper into the groove. My plan was a success, nobody had seemed to notice me so it was very likely I would be alone and unhindered. The further I walked, the less I heard people, until I heard nothing but nature. This place was not huge, like I previously stated, but I had walked for maybe another hour and a half and there was still no sign of other humans. It was definitely strange looking back on it, but I paid no mind to it that day. I did end up taking some pretty great shots. Lots of birds and insects but notably a tanuki, a couple wild ferrets, the mamushi, lucky me found the only venomous snake in the area, and a quite large toad. I was most definitely more satisfied with the pictures I got in the late afternoon, but time had gotten the best of me and I knew it would be dark before I got back to the path. I did not want to be stuck in a forest after dark, no matter how small, I'd seen the Blair Witch Project enough times. The hike back was rough because I was a bit fatigued and definitely feeling the weight of my backpack. I had to slow down quite considerably due to the bamboo being more dense in my area. The sun had set completely, and I knew that I would be hiking another 45 minutes to an hour before I got back to the path, that I was told would be lit, so I turned on my phone's flashlight and started to hustle more because my insect repellent had worn off and I was being eaten alive by bugs. 
It was not long after my projected time that I saw some light up ahead, so I did what anybody would do and headed straight towards it. Everything that happens after this point is both a blur and my most vivid memories. Please excuse me on some of the details of what I experienced, I never thought I would be writing this down because all I wanted to do was forget about it, I still do but have accepted I never will. It was no shock to me to find a small shrine-like hut in the forest, I later learned I should have been shocked, but it was a bit shocking that I didn't seem to be anywhere near the path. I was exhausted, and the sound of my own pulse coupled with the insects buzzing was nearly deafening at this point. When I was able to enter the small clearing I instantly realized that one of the sounds I had been hearing was music, it was so subtle and gentle I had somehow not registered it in my brain. After noticing the sound of music, I noticed something almost as obvious, right next to the candlelit shrine was a woman, a geisha, presumably one of the actors, sitting cross-legged and facing away from me. She was the source of the music, she was playing one of those Japanese guitar-like instruments, a samisen, or three-string. She was obviously quite skilled, as much as I hate to admire anything about that night. It wasn't too long after I had entered the clearing that she started singing. It was in Japanese and I hardly understood any of the words enough to tell you what it was about, but while listening to her song I noticed she was facing a pond. The water was so dark that I could hardly see it except for the reflection of the candles. Her song seemed so soothing I almost forgot I was lost, and as much as I wanted to get out of there and back to my hotel, I was also painfully shy. So shy that I was too afraid to interrupt her mid-song or to startle her, so I stood there and waited for her to finish. But that was the thing, she would never finish. She always started the song again from the beginning. In retrospect, the song was not soothing at all. It sounded mournful. After probably half an hour of her singing her song over and over, I worked up the strength to speak to her, but it took another fifteen minutes before words would actually leave my mouth. I cleared my throat and then spoke, Shitsuri I Shimasu, I said, which was a very polite way to say, excuse me. There was no response, but she definitely heard me. I didn't think anything of it at the time. I had the sudden urge to photograph this moment since the scenery seemed so beautiful with the pond and the candles and the geisha playing shamisen, so I lifted the camera that was strapped around my neck and snapped a picture with the flash on. In the midst of her playing and singing, she had stopped for a mere microsecond and slightly glanced in my direction. It was so quick and so subtle but in my brain it was the longest and most awkward pause of my life. She paid no mind to my presence at all. I felt as if I was rude, so I waited a bit before speaking again. Maybe she just wanted to finish this last repeat of the song before speaking. When she slightly turned towards me I did not see anything out of the ordinary, but a few seconds, that felt like years, later my brain registered that the woman was wearing a mask. That was definitely creepy to me but I also was naive and figured that it was a tradition of some sort. Time no longer felt real to me. I don't know how long I stood there watching her sing but my impatience finally overpowered my introvertedness and I spoke up again, in my poor Japanese, excuse me, is the path near here. I know I shouldn't have strayed off and I apologize but dash, but mid-sentence she just dropped her samisen and stood up. Everything she did seemed to be slow motion while also happening in a mere matter of seconds. She silently stood there, a few meters away and not facing me, for a few moments before she turned in one fluid motion to face me. I was right, she was wearing a mask. I will never forget the feeling when I first saw her up front. Her hair was pulled up into a top bun, she had a slender and youngish looking figure that was cloaked in a lavender kimono. The ends of each billowing sleeve were a shade of light blue and the bottom of her dress was a bit muddy but also appeared to have light blue on it. There was a bright red obi tied around her waist that seemed to really stand out, as it was made of a much nicer material than the kimono itself and the knot in the back was extremely intricate. Then there was the mask. It was round and mostly white with almost childlike features. The two eye slits were designed to look like eyeliner on the cartoonish eyelids drawn around it. The eyelids and top lip were dark red, but the bottom lip was black. Now that I think of it, it might have been a mouth hole. 
There were no other details on the mask, even a nose, which seemed to be the creepiest part. At this point I still wasn't terrified yet, as I said before I was naive so I still thought maybe she was just gathering her thoughts or something. I lost my shit completely however, when she took one step towards me. She had only moved her right foot forward and shifted her weight when the bun on her head suddenly became undone and all of her hair fell to her shoulders and back. It was unnaturally long and unkept. I remember my heart sinking and I couldn't comprehend why until a few more year-long seconds had passed by. I was drenched in sweat at this point, I was shaking, and I couldn't move or speak. She, on the other hand, just stood there. The sound of the wind through the bamboo no longer sounded beautiful, it twisted into an eerie and mournful whisper. I stared into the hollow eyelids from a few meters away from her. I didn't blink because I felt like I would die if I looked away from her. I remember an inaudible conversation between us with me begging and pleading for my life promising everything I would delete the picture I took and praying to a god I didn't believe in while all she did was laugh. But there were no words that escaped either of our mouths. After another uncomfortable measure of time she began to reach up, which had made me clench and almost vomit but she was reaching for her mask and suddenly all of the pressure inside of me faded away. I was getting so worked up over nothing, she was gonna remove her mask and speak to me and show me the way out of the forest. She was only staring at me because I'm a strange man approaching her in a dark forest, anybody would be a bit taken aback by that. So much relief poured throughout my body, it was honestly better than sex. Once her hands reached her mask and she started to lift it from her head I instantly knew why my heart sank so hard a few moments ago. The music. It was. Still. Playing. At that moment my body which had relaxed into a more comfortable posture had frozen again and I remember the taste of stomach acid in the back of my throat. Her mournful song was still playing in the background, and the moans of the bamboo were playing in tune with it. The mask was completely lifted from her face, and her hands just released it from above her head and it fell to the ground with a hollow sound. I remember the noise well because I had watched the mask fall, the first time I looked away from her face for a mere second, and when I looked back I wished I was dead. She had no eyes. Nothing. Not even eyelids. Just flat skin where eyes should be. At this point I know you are all thinking of what you would do, how you'd run away or punch her in the face or whatever, but this was real life. No matter how scared I was, there was still a part of me that lived in the facts and science reality where I hoped this was just a birth defect and I was being overly judgmental or something. Unfortunately that wasn't the case, not at all. There is no longer any part of me that believes in the reality that I did before then. The eyeless woman, still mid-step, was looking right at me despite having no eyes. I felt her gaze, I felt the pure evil emanating from her void of a face. She completed the step with her left foot and her music grew louder, almost deafening. The sounds of bamboo and creaking wood were so loud I wanted to cover my ears but I couldn't. There was an enormous pounding sound along with screeching that sounded like a poorly tuned violin. The sounds were so loud at this point that they were enough to drive someone completely insane, they went on forever in that moment of her second step. My whole body was covered in goosebumps and I was trembling so hard I felt like I was going to pass out, but the adrenaline had kept me standing. My fight or flight responses failed me as I couldn't do either one. Her third step was accompanied by louder music and the sound of wood being ripped apart, as if it was coming from the shrine. Her fourth step, I could hear her singing again, but distorted by the pain inside of my head. Her fifth step, I was almost blinded by my own migraine. Sixth step and everything around me began to twist and unravel. On her seventh step, everything stopped completely. In the time it takes for a candle to flicker she had completely vanished. I gained the ability to run at this point, and before I could even shift my weight the candles flickered again and the sound came back full force and she was right in front of me, inches from my face. Her head was tilted and her lips curved into the faintest, most menacing smile I've ever seen and I will never be able to unburn it from my mind. Still unable to speak, 
I spun around and planned to run as fast as I could in the opposite direction, but something cold had wrapped around my wrist. With great strength, the clasping hand of the eyeless woman spun me around to face her again. This time her mouth had widened and her lips had curled to reveal a row of sharp, monstrous teeth. There was no longer much about her that looked human. She sprung forward towards my face and I managed to use my other arm to protect myself from her and I summoned the strength to push her off of me. My arm was on fire, and the pain was spreading through me, but I didn't have any time to react. I just ran. I didn't know if she was chasing me or if it was even worth it to run from her. For all I knew she would appear in front of me again. I couldn't stop though, even if the music was still deafening in my ears, I managed to run for a few minutes before it began to dim and my thoughts were almost back to me. I continued running until I saw another light in the distance. I wanted to avoid it but my legs would only carry me forward. I remember screaming and crying as I was forcefully stopped by a man, who shouted something in Japanese and more people with flashlights approached. After that I blacked out. It wasn't until the next morning when I woke up in the hospital, my head was still ringing from the music and my body was in a lot of pain, mainly my right arm. There were issues communicating until an American tourist was brought in by one of the police officers to translate for me. I asked him what happened and after translating to the officer he only responded by asking me where I was the night before. I told him I went off trail in the bamboo grove and that's all but he didn't believe me. You lucky. The officer said in shoddy English, bypassing the translator. Why can't I move my arms? I asked, groaning in pain. The American then translated from the police, you were reported missing by your employer when you didn't contact them, but we only found you because the innkeeper searched your room and found your itinerary when you missed your checkout time yesterday. When they found you last night you had a broken left wrist and a mamushi bite on your right forearm. Yesterday. I asked completely ignoring the latter part of his explanation, no, I check out tomorrow. I corrected him. Although I was very thankful to have been found, I was quite angry that they messed up my checkout date and went through my things. He didn't seem convinced so I reached over to my backpack and showed him the folded copy of my itinerary I had in the smallest pocket. All he did was show it to the American whose eyes then widened and he stared at me with an odd look. I'll always remember what happened next. Uh, here. He said, lighting up the lock screen on his phone so I can see the date and time. Everything seemed normal until I saw the date. Th that can't be right. I shouted in a panic, the horrors of my experience crawling back into my mind, I was just gone for a night. You missing three days. The officer said to me, starting to look rather defensive. My heart had dropped. None of this made any sense. That cold grip, I could still feel it on my wrist despite it being reset and in a cast. My right arm was hardly even working, from what, a mamushi bite. I remember blocking the strike of the woman, but I never noticed that she had bit me. I spent a very long time trying to explain the situation and the occurrence of the night before, as I was still convinced it was just the last night. I never made it anywhere with them. My story kept being discounted. There were no shrines like the one I described, no geishas that worked there stayed late, there's no way I could have hiked that long in a straight line without reaching any people, there was no break in the barricade. I didn't believe anything they were telling me, as far as I knew they were just playing a cruel joke on me. I knew there was only one thing I could do to prove I was telling the truth. I leaned over slightly ripping out the four in my arm that I had just become aware of, causing me to wince in pain and retract. I pointed to my camera and the officer grabbed it from the top of my bag on the chair by my bed. He handed it to me and the two of them leaned over my shoulders to look at me scrolling through my pictures. I remember them both commenting on how great my shots were, not knowing where I was going with this all. Then I got to the last picture I took of the toad. After this one would be the geisha, then they would both realize I wasn't crazy. I fought all of the hesitation that was building up in my thumb and pressed the button with my eyes squinted shut. The two men said nothing at all. When I opened my eyes I was more confused than the two men next to me. 
It was just a picture of the snake from earlier, but coiled up and facing away from me. This only proved to them that my bite must have come from this snake after I aggravated it with my flash, but I know what I saw that night, and a mamushi would never even slightly compare to the horrors I experienced. I was in the hospital for a few weeks after the incident. A mamushi bite takes a lot of recovery time, apparently. So after I made it out of the hospital I was able to gather my things that the hospital had graciously stored for me and fly home. I was unable to complete my job, as once my employer found out that I was found hallucinating in the woods with a snake bite by the police. They decided it was time I came back anyway, not that I would ever dream of staying in Japan. Nobody in Kyoto had believed me about that night. They thought that I was completely insane. I later heard they searched that groove through and through multiple times, doing a complete sweep with search dogs, and never found any trace of me, that's why they didn't believe me when I said I was there the whole time. The only reason they found me is because on the final sweep when everyone was headed home, they said one of the dogs suddenly started going nuts in the direction I came from. The police suspected I was on some kind of meth binge and that's why I was so shaken up and crazy when they found me, especially with my injuries I couldn't explain, and I'm sure my job believed that as well because they unfortunately let me go when I came back. As for the pictures on my camera, I threw the SD card away. I never thought I would ever want to be reminded of this trip again. I never planned on writing any of this down or ever probing my memory for the fine details. There was also a part of me afraid that the last picture would one day revert to what I originally saw that night, and I wasn't ready to see it. It wasn't until this week that I had to really dig back into the events of that night, as I almost believed that maybe it was all just a hallucination. I was starting to have dreams about that night, and I thought maybe if I finally wrote about it that I would find some sort of peace.